Uh, we give you praise, Lord, for the promises that we hold in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And, and we humbly ask now that you come be a part of this message. I pray that you empower the words by the presence of your Holy Spirit and do your holy work within us. Uh, may that be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, I want to start by, just by asking a simple question. How do you feel? How do you feel about change? Do, do you embrace it? Do you welcome it? Or are you easily tagged as, as someone where they're going to say, oh, no, 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 no. He or she, no, no. They resist change. They, they, they avoid it at all costs. I, I think I'm a person who, who embraces change. Uh, moving from the Midwest to New England, that was pretty easy. Changing careers in my mid-40s, uh, I, I said, let's do it. Rollerblading for the first time at nearly 50 years old with my middle school Sunday school class, I think they would say, ah, Mr. Hughes, he crushed it. But I did it, and I'm alive to prove it. So <laughs> I like change. I like risk. But you know what? The hardest change and the challenge I face are those internal changes. Those are always a little bit easier than the external. I try to tell my kids all the time, I don't want to be labeled as another parent where their children grow older and say, oh, that's dad. He'll never change. He's so set in his ways. You know, I want them to see me growing and changing throughout my life, serving others, loving their mother with more passion and becoming more like Jesus all the time. And I think that's the definition of exercising godliness. That's, that's what exercising godliness looks like. The problem is we don't live in a bubble. There are things all around us that place enormous, enormous pressure on our life and what I, I want to accomplish day in and day out. And of course, that has never been more true than what we experienced in 2020 and what remains in 2021. Well, this text in Colossians chapter three was also written in a time of confusion, anxiety, and difficulty, just like today. The question is, well, how did the early church survive during those times? Not just survive, how did the early church really thrive? In this season, when God challenges us with these kinds of words, in, in this tumultuous time, I mean, what he's really asking is, what is Jesus trying to change in me right now? And I, I think that's the question and the theme that we have to own. I know we are bombarded with the uncertainty for the future and, and what, what's coming next, but I think this is where we need to really park. Jesus wants to engage us in this transformation process of exercising godliness, especially in a time filled with pain and anger and frustration and, and the heartbreak that we see all around us. And God wants to shine his light. And he wants to do this through us to a hurting world around us. But here's some truths that we really need to think clearly about. If we want to see stability in the world around us, and we all do, then I think we must allow the Lord to search us individually and impart stability within us. I know we're desperate to see stability outside the world, but you know what? God wants to know what's Jesus changing and challenging right now so there's stability within us. And that's what we find here in Paul's letter to the Colossians. We know other truths. People only change as much as they are willing to change. We, we do understand that. We also know when we search the scriptures, prophetic promises remained unfulfilled over people's lives. Well, that, that's a statement, right? Prophetic promises remain unfulfilled over people's lives if they fail to join in the process of transformation. If they fail to join God in this process of exercising his holy commands and purpose in our lives. And this is the moment, friends, this is the moment where God shapes lives. He shapes lives during the difficulty, during the pain, during the heartache, during the anxiety. And endurance produces faith. This is the moment where God works in our heart to change the people around us. You know, there's a saying that captures this really beautifully. Um, we, we know that for such a time as this, we want to say Lord, use me. This is what we want to stand and say together. 
But here's a saying that is attributed to Eleanor Roosevelt, John F. Kennedy, and, and a Chinese proverb. And it goes like this. It's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. It's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. There, there's a lot of cursing the darkness in this world right now. We, we know that. And this is not how we exercise godliness. In this day, in this day and age, God wants to raise up people who will be his light in this world, not complainers and those who find fault with others and everything that surrounds them. Not the combatant who take to Facebook and social media with such hatred and slander. No, no. Those who can keep their focus on the main thing, avoid all these distractions, and, and not put their hopes just in the vaccine, but put their hopes and trust in the living God. They're the ones who are positioned to exercise godliness. So here, we, here are some things God wants us to do in our lives to teach us to be, this, to be this light in a world, into this dark world, so that we can light the candle and stop cursing the darkness. How to exercise our godliness and be his people in challenging times. Here's the first thing. The first thing, very simple, and Paul's so clear with the Colossians, focus on the right thing. The first thing we learn here in Paul's words is we need to focus on the right things and not the wrong things. Now, let, let's be honest. If, if we think back throughout time, there has been fad after fad after fad, whether it is nutrition or exercise, that just captivates the masses. Here are some exercise fads of the past, right? Notice that all these fads are focusing themselves on the very easy. Only 10 minutes a day, that's what they're going to say. Or for a simple payment of $90 a month, you can look like this. I'm not sure I want to look like this, but, but these are the promises that they're selling, right? And all of these fads, all of these fads depend on human effort. And they all focus, they all focus on the wrong thing. It might be the right body part that they're concerned about, but they're focused on the wrong thing, the wrong method. So Paul's clear, focus on the right thing. And he says early here, he says, set your heart and mind on the things above. Set your heart and mind on the things above. Our lives reflect what we pursue. Just like what we do with exercise and nutrition is gonna be reflected in our, our body image. Our lives reflect what we pursue and what we put into it. That's certainly true for exercise. And, and as Paul writes from this Roman prison in a murky political system, he talked about the key agenda that, that we should pursue. And this requires us to make different choices. It requires us to make different choices. If we are going to be a light that God called us to be, it requires us to make different choices because in this turmoil, you know, in this turmoil, we need to look at what we're allowing our heart to be drawn to. And that's why Paul says twice, he says, set your heart, set your mind. You know, this is the idea of the will, the understanding, the intellect, the emotions. Paul saying, set these things on things above. This is how God grows us up. This is how we exercise godliness. Make no mistake about it. God allows us to determine what our heart will pursue and what will imprint the very core of our being. So in the midst of Colossae and everywhere else and all that we're dealing with in 2020 and 2021, in the darkness, we must remember who we are and what we are called to. Paul tells us, set your heart and mind on heaven's virtues, things, things above. You know, will this be our agenda or is it going to be the world's agenda that we're focused on and what we're longing to become? Do you agree with me? That's what Paul's saying here. Do you agree with me that we need to reshape our focus when we exercise our godliness and focus on things above? And we have to recognize that this battle will always be there. There's a way to be lights in the world and not to add to this darkness but you cannot live in the spirit of this world and change the spirit of this world. 
That, that's such an important thing to remember. We can't be, be absorbed into the chaos of this world to, and think that that's how we're going to affect the world. Another way of saying this, you can't breathe in all this chaos and be absorbed with the chaos and then hope to live in God's presence tomorrow. You have to live in and soak in God's spirit, God's word, into the fellowship of the saints. And what we should be hoping on is prayer and, and knowing that God is going to move in, in this difficult, difficult time. So this requires us uh, really to recognize how important it is to follow God in every journey of life. I mean, let me just give you two examples here in the scriptures. And in fact, it's in the scripture here today. It's in Colossians 4 and chapter 14. Paul gives his farewell salutations and greetings. He does this at almost every one of his letters. He'll say something like he does here. Luke greets you, as does Demas. So-and-so greets you with a holy kiss. Peace and grace to you from Barnabas and, and so on. Well, here in, in the end of the letter to the Colossians in chapter 4, verse 14, this is what he writes. Luke greets you, as does Demas. Again, very common. He does this in almost every letter, and we barely give it a thought, uh, let alone study these names and what becomes of them. I guess we assume if Paul's sending his greetings on their behalf, that, that these individuals must go on to do great things. Well, we know Luke, of course, Dr. Luke, the beloved Dr. Luke, as, as Paul uh, refers to him, we, we know that he goes off to do wonderful things in the kingdom, uh, for the kingdom. He wrote the, the Gospel of Luke, of course, and of course, the book of Acts. Uh, but what about Demas? What happens to Demas? Well, you know what? We, we really, we don't know. All, all we do know is that it, uh, some of the last words that Paul wrote uh, right before his uh, Roman execution, they, they expressed heartbreak about Demas. Take a look at 2 Timothy 4.10. Here's what Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 4.10. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. Has deserted me. He went on to Thessalonica. Uh, again, we don't know the, all the facts, but maybe Demas uh, feared being executed as, as Paul was about to be executed, and he fled to safety. Or maybe he succumbed to some immorality, or maybe he simply caved into the relentless uh, temptation of a more comfortable, prosperous life in this grand city of Thessalonica. Whatever it was, Paul saw it as embracing the world. But look at this. Just a few sentences later, in the same letter to Timothy, Paul says something very hope giving about somebody else. Luke alone is with me. Okay, we know Luke goes on to do great things. But then he says this, get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Do you remember Mark? Remember Mark? He, he had been the first to desert the team way back when. He left. Back in the early days during the, the first missionary trip with Paul and Barnabas, he took off to Pamphylia and re returned home. And, and then it's recorded later in the book of Acts that he, he wanted to come back and, and Paul wanted nothing to do with it. He wanted nothing of Paul's return. But here we have Mark at the end of Paul's life, fully reconciled to the team, fully trusted by Paul and very useful to the gospel ministry. You see, Demas and Mark, this is a contrast. It's a, it's a word of warning and a word of hope. And as people who stumble in many ways, we really need both. Demas began well. Four or five years earlier, uh, during another imprisonment, Paul refers to Demas as a fellow worker in the gospel. There, there was a time when Demas apparently really chose well what he was going to focus, what he was going to prioritize. But it doesn't appear to have ended well with Demas. Having once fought alongside Paul in the kingdom battles, he seems to have sided with the enemy and deserted them for the temptations of the world. So the warning is, is this, and, and it's written in 1 Peter, you know, be sober-minded, be watchful. Our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. 
Resist him firm in your faith. Pursue heavenly virtues. We know our enemy is real, and we know our enemy is crafty. He threatens and seduces. And even those who start strong and, and are strong leaders, even like Demas, are susceptible to his deceptions. Dem uh, Demas did not do well at exercising godliness. He did not keep his eye on the right things. Mark, on the other hand, gives us hope. You know, he had a very weak start. He didn't appear to have all the right stuff, and, and he disappointed Paul and, and perhaps the other leaders and his friends, and he, and he left them uh, to, to bear the heat of the battle, and, and Mark went home. But Mark ended well. At some point, he rejoined the battle, and, and he proved very faithful, trusted, and he was a useful warrior for the gospel. There, there's an example of exercising godliness to focus on what matters most. So let us then be on, on guard. I mean, this is the, the message here. Be on guard. We live, we live with this indwelling sin that is really inclined toward insanity, if you think about it, because it's inclined to believe lies that lead to our destruction, just like we want to believe. We want to believe these charlatans. We do. And, and there's so many more that just we see day after day after day. We want to believe these products that it's that easy and it, it takes no human effort. And when we are feeling this powerful pull of worldly temptation, we need to take Paul's exhortation very seriously. Here in 1 Timothy, he writes, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Flee these things. Pursue righteousness. Pursue godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. Paul knew what he was talking about because he was up close and he watched co-laborers fall. The battle never stops, friends. I know it seems so simple to say, focus on the right thing, but the battle never stops. We have to always set our hearts on the right things. We must give priority to our walk with God in every season. That's seasons of heartbreak and pain, seasons of... Uh, wants and seasons of plenty. That's in the joy and, and, and in the sadness. It's in youth and it's in old age, learning to walk with Jesus during every season and how he comes to us. Every season presents different challenges and different focuses of our time. Uh, of course, it makes it very trying and difficult to trust and believe and to follow and to discipline ourselves, to rest in his promises. Paul says, look, you have to set your heart and your mind someplace. Set those things on the right things and on things above. So today, no matter where you are on the political divide of this nation, or, or the racial tensions, or the fight for justice, or this pandemic, or, or how we're going to navigate forward with care and confidence, the solution for, for us friends as believers is to set our mind on things above. Focus on God's agenda for your life. That's the most important thing. I, I talk often to students, school is not the most important thing. I know it feels like it, the pressure of sometimes our parents and the teachers and the school and the prestige. School is not the most important thing. Your grade is not the most important thing. And neither is work or our retirement portfolios or our marriage or love, the pursuit of love. The most important thing is that we're walking with God day after day after day. That's the prayer every parent should have for his child, that they walk with God day after day. The most important thing is the most important thing. Walking into the promises of God for his will of your life. So set your heart on things above. Well, this, this is how we exercise godliness. Now, Paul's going to do a shift here, and, and he's going to start to talk about how we deal with these things within our heart, because it's a journey over time. It's a, it's a race worth running. So we need to strategize, not just set our hearts on these things, but we need to strategize if we're going to walk into this transformation process, if, if we are actually going to exercise godliness. It's kind of like uh, 
joining a gym. It's great that you join the gym, but you have to go and you have to utilize the equipment. So Paul's going to turn here and he's, he's going to say something else very sim simple. Exercise and godliness. First, focus on the right thing. The second thing is we have to really deal with the issues that we're facing. We have to, we can't ignore them. As we walk into that transformation process, we must face the things that we struggle with. And he, and he says it this way, put to death. I mean, that's a pretty strong word, right? Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Put it to death. Deal with it head on. Deal with your issues. Do not ignore them. If I'm going to grow and become the person God calls me to be, I have to learn how to deal with my issues. You know, it's, it's a fundamental problem on our journey. We have to do this sort of football term, and they call it self-scouting. We have to self-scout, look at ourselves in the mirror, and really take a hard look at how am I living my life? And the problem with so many believers is that we compartmentalize our lives. This is my spiritual life. Uh, this is my work life. This is my family life. This is my money. And, and these worlds never get to meet. And that's a very dangerous way and, and the exact opposite of exercising godliness. So Paul's going to tell us, Take all those compartments and deal with them and pull them together. And that's the problem, though. We, you know, what we say, what we believe, what we value never interacts with the person we're called to be. And Paul will not allow the Colossians to do that. And he's calling them out. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. He's calling them to address any compartmentalizing in their life. If, if you're seeking things above, then you must become aware of your issues, anything that's holding you back. Personal growth begins when the Holy Spirit makes us, convicts us of our issues. So knowing what God has called you to aspire to is one thing. It's a wonderful thing if you know what God has called you to be. That is wonderful. But Paul's saying, knowing what undermines those aspirations is another. Do we know the things in our life that keep us or undermine us from being salt and light in this world? You see, hoping for change will never bring change. Only obedience will. That's why Paul tells us, be aware of them. It's just one thing to be aware of them, and acknowledging them is another, and dealing with them is something altogether different. It's, again, back to exercise. We, we might know the right things to eat, but we actually have to put that into practice. We might know the areas of our body that need exercise as, as we age or post-injury, but we actually have to do the painful work of physical therapy or whatever it is before us to actually see change take place. And, and those who avoid compartmentalizing their life, let me tell you this, those who avoid compartmentalizing their life are ruthless in getting these things that undermine their pursuit of God's will out of their life. I mean, that's the trick. We have to be ruthless to, to identify anything that undermines our ability to exercise Godless, and we need to remove it as quickly as we possibly Ultimately, we, we, we've got to join God in this transformation process. We, we cannot live the way we always have lived and then become what God calls you to be. We just can't. We have to make these hard changes, focusing on his priorities and getting rid of those things that undermine the process. We need to be ruthless in addressing those things that undermine it. And Paul is clear that this is a painful painful process. Taking up your cross and following Jesus is a painful process of self-denial, a challenging, difficult, painful process. Paul's going to go on, and we're going to look at this next week. He's going to unpack two forces that undermine our pursuit of God, two really very powerful forces that, that are going to teach us how to stay focused on godliness. But it begins right here, by, by looking to heaven first, seeking the kingdom first, and then getting rid of anything, dealing with anything that undermines our pursuit of godliness. Please pray with me. 
Father God, we thank you and love you, and we praise you for your holy word, for being so direct, for, for the living, active word that convicts and, and cleans and restores. We, we pray for that restoration process, Lord. Jesus, you are in the business of restoration of the human soul, and we praise you for salvation, and we just ask you, Lord, please help us to exercise godliness so that we can be more like you day by day and change this world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.